Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. We want to welcome you to our Data for Nutrition webinar series. Today's topic is on contributions of the Latin American and Caribbean food security scale to global food insecurity monitoring and policy making globally. Thanks to all who are joining us live, but also to those of you who might be watching this as a recording on YouTube. We're glad you're with us. Next slide. Uh, just to give a little housekeeping before we start, um, we keep all participant videos and microphones muted during all presentations. So we ask that you use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to submit your questions for the panel or for any of the speakers. And please feel free to type in a question at any time. And then when it comes to the discussion, we'll get to as many questions as we can. Um, a recording of this webinar will be available on the Data for Nutrition YouTube channel immediately after it finishes, and then the slides and a Q&A summary will be posted in the community in the coming week. Next slide. If you're having any trouble, uh, technically, please go ahead and uh, select all panelists in the Zoom chat, and we'll try to do what we can to respond to you during the webinar um, if you're having any trouble with connectivity. Next slide. And so just to remind folks about the Data for Nutrition Community of Practice, uh, we are a community of practice that provides members with opportunities to share knowledge, experience, and questions relevant to strengthening the nutrition data value chain at all levels for the purpose of achieving better nutrition outcomes in low and middle income countries. We have 884 members and continue to grow, and we always welcome anyone who's interested to approach us about sharing a webinar or posting a resource. I'd like to introduce you to the moderator for today's webinar. Pablo Gaitan Rossi is an associate professor at the Research Center for Equitable Development at the Universidad Iberoamericana. Hand it over to you, Pablo. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm so happy to be here moderating this webinar in such an important topic. Uh, today we'll be discussing uh, the contributions of the Latin American and Caribbean Food Security Scale, the ELCSA. We will be focusing on, uh, on its importance on food security monitoring and policy making globally, which is an important topic, especially now during the pandemic. Um, so I'm uh, I'm honored to be joining a group of, of true experts in, in the topic. Uh, they, they are experts that know the, the history of the ELCSA scale, but also the intricacies and the different applications of the scale. So um, let's begin with uh, our first speaker. Uh, he's Dr. Rafael Perez Escamilla, and he's the director of the Global Health Concentration at the Yale School of Public Health. He co-led the development, validation, and dissemination of the ELSA scale, and his work has led to improvements in maternal, infant, and young child feeding and household food security programs globally. So, uh, Rafael. Thank you so very much, uh, Pablo, for your kind introduction and uh, greetings to everyone. If I could have my first slide, please. So I will speak about how ELSA and other experience-based scales have influenced household and individual food security monitoring and policies globally. Next. Next. So uh, in, during my talk today, I will explain to you why and how I got involved with household food insecurity measurement. I will take you through a journey that I've had from EVIA, to the voices of the hungry food insecurity experience scale. I will then go on to briefly discuss how can experience-based food security scales can help improve food security governance, and then where should we go from here? Next. So with regards to my involvement with EBIA, it was almost a, by accident when in 2003, I arrived to the University of Campinas in Brazil to do a sabbatical with my dear colleague, Ana Maria Segal Correa. If we can click the next bullet, please. Because upon arrival, everything that I could hear was about 
the inauguration of a new very promising president, which was Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva, and the major uh, hunger eradication agenda that he ran when he won, when he got, uh, when he won the election. Uh, I asked Ana Maria if Brazil had a, a standardized a official scale to measure household foreign security. Uh, she said no, so we approach uh, the government and we're able to get a little bit of funding to start with a very small study in 125 households in Campinas to see if the adaptation of the US Household Food Security Survey module to the context of Brazil uh, could work, at least uh, first starting with a pilot study. Next bullet, please. In 2003, we conducted the validation then in four additional cities and subsequently next bullet in numerous also urban areas and rural areas in the country. And everything was guided through a very inclusive, multi-stakeholder, highly participatory process. So next bullet, please. So by 2004, just a little bit over a year, we persuaded the Brazilian government to invest over a million dollars in collecting data in 130,000 households in the whole country. Next, please. And since then, EBIA, the Brazilian food insecurity scale has been included in both household expenditures as well as a demographic and health service repeatedly since 2004. Next, please. And it has become a major research and policy instrument to advance food security in the country. Next. So if you want to read about the validation, the first validation, the first article of the validation in Campinas, this is the reference. The next, please. And if you want to read about validation in a, one of the rural areas in Sao Paulo, Brazil, this is the reference. Next. So I know all of you are very familiar with experience-based food security scale. So very briefly, the EBIA looks very similar to the US Household Food Security Server module asking questions about a, a running out of food, a, you know, in terms of quantity, also in terms of quality of foods. It asks a, a family a respondent for the family if they have been worried in the household about running out of food, everything in the context of poverty. And this and the next slide show that questions are asked in the context of both adults in the household as well as children. Next, please. And next, please. So as a result of the application of EBIA, the government was able to show that between 2004 and 2009, severe food insecurity in Brazil was reduced by about 30% and the reductions were even greater in the poorest areas, the poorest regions in the country than in the better off regions, even though it went down substantially everywhere. This allowed the government of Brazil to fully justify the massive investments that uh, they were making in improving uh, food security and reducing uh, social and health inequities across the board. Next. So uh, what was very interesting was that uh, the press conference that we gave uh, at the IBG headquarters, the Brazilian Institute for Geography and Statistics that runs the nationally representative household expenditure survey known as ASPINADE, really showed that by that time, this happened in 2006, the media were already persuaded about the scientific validity of the scale, they started to really understand the meaning of food insecurity, the different dimensions of food insecurity. And uh, very importantly, they started asking the candidates that were running for the new presidential election what they were going to do about it. So none of the candidates was able to basically say food insecurity or hunger 
uh, do not exist anymore in Brazil. They rather had became almost a competition as to which one would invest more in uh, food insecurity and hunger eradication. Uh, we know that the result of that election was that President Lula got reelected for another four year term. Next, please. It also, very importantly, if uh, we can go to the next slide, uh, and just, just click the bullets for this slide, please. Uh, we have also been able to show uh, with Avia and the re its repeated application that uh, food insecurity worsened in Brazil between 2013 and uh, 2018. And uh, this is very important. Just please uh, keep on clicking on the bullets for this slide. So this is very important because uh, it really shows that uh, the VIA was powerful not only to show reductions in severe food insecurity when there were investments in more equitable social policies, but also it was able to show the worsening as a result of the dramatic shifts in the policies from the newly elected uh, political uh, administrations in, in Brazil. Next bullet, please. So uh, essentially it left uh, the leader of the country with no option uh, but to recognize that uh, during his time and through, as part of his policies, the severe food insecurity situation in Brazil deteriorated after having improved for many years uh, previous to his, uh, uh, his election. And I'm referring it now to President Bolsonaro. Next, please. So please click, I think there are four or five bullets here. So in, in summary, the EBA experience, uh, EBA was advocated for and developed with strong government leadership. EBA was adopted by the Brazilian Institute of Statistics, the Ministry of Social Development, the Ministry of Health, among others. EBIA became the official household food insecurity measure through food and nutrition security law. EBIA informed CISAN and justified Bolsa Familia. And EBIA informed and guided the work of the National Food and Nutrition Security Councils, or CONSEA. And as I just mentioned, EBIA documented recent worsening of HA household food insecurity in Brazil. Next. And it, during the COVID pandemic, EBIA was also crucial to show that during the pandemic, eh, about 19 million people have had experienced severe food insecurity, which was twice as much as during the previous year. So again, the government was held accountable as a result of having EBIA in place to respond to the food insecurity and hunger crisis eh, that became even more acute as a result of COVID in Brazil. Next. So also this led to major attention from the world. For example, this is a piece that uh, was published in the New York Times describing the findings from the report, uh, the COVID food insecurity report. And if we go to the next, I really think that this says us all when we can see in the next slide that it actually became a, a, the front page news in the New York Times. And but without the experience it based food security scale, it would have not been possible for this outcome to happen and to bring major awareness uh, to all of society within and outside of Brazil as to what was happening and continues to happen in the country. Next, please. So then EBIA, as we know, was very instrumental for the development of ELSA. And why was the need to develop a Latin American and Caribbean a food security scale? Well, first, because there was a need to standardize the measurement in the Latin American and Caribbean region, according to uh, the, the, the colleagues uh, that we formed the network. Uh, uh, also, uh, the experience-based food security scales had shown excellent psychometric behavior and predictive and convergence validity. And very importantly, we have been able to generate a strong enthusiasm from not only academicians, but also governments, the Pan American Health Organization and the regional office of the FAO in Santiago, Chile. Next, please. So at the end of the day, ELSA was, is a granddaughter of the US Household Food Security Survey module 
and it, it is a, the daughter of a combination of the experience-based uh, scales from Colombia, Brazil, as well as the USA ID Fanta HFIAS. Next, please. So uh, ELXA was also developed through a highly uh, inclusive and consultative process. And the key milestone was a major uh, conference that we co-hosted in 2007 in Medellin, Colombia, that was attended by many government and uh, academic representatives from many Latin American countries where we sat down for several days and didn't leave until we had consensus on all the items to be included as part of the ELXA scale. Next, please. So at the end of the day, you know, this is just to illustrate the major partnerships and also that it took five years to actually go from the initial, uh, you know, meeting, a technical meeting in Medellin, Colombia, hosted by the University of Antioquia together with other US universities for ELSA to finally have been uh, published as the official measure for Latin America and the Caribbean by the FAO. Next. So this question is uh, very important, which is if these experience-based scales can help improve uh, food security governance. And if we go to the next slide, uh, I know I am, I am short on time, so I strongly urge you to read uh, these two papers that actually uh, provide very good insights uh, that strongly suggest that these experience-based scales can indeed uh, help improve food security governance. And we're providing some uh, specific examples to that effect. And if we go to the next slide, uh, and this is in the context of this definition of food security governance uh, published by FAO in 2011. Next, please. So what do decision makers think about the utility of experience-based scales? And I think that the most illustrative quote that I have been able to come uh, has been brought to my attention is presented on the next slide when uh, Patreus Ananias, uh, who was the Minister for Social Development and Hunger Abatement, uh, while uh, EBIA was being born and developed, actually, you can see at the bottom how he really thought that one of the most important outcomes and steps taken as part of the Fomesero or Zero Hunger Strategy was precisely EBIA because it would allow subsequent impact evaluations of Brazilian food and nutrition security policies. And if you can see on the next slide, uh, as I have already shown below, uh, this is clearly uh, evident by the ability of having been able to very quickly generate a, a, a very important baseline that has really served as the basis for the Brazilian government and civil society and other organizations to be able uh, to closely monitor the changes, uh, the improvements and worsenings of food uh, security in Brazil and to try to understand them in the context of dramatic changes in levels of investment in social policies. Next, please. So is the research conducted with these scales useful for decision makers? And if we go to the next uh, slide, I strongly urge you to uh, really uh, read a recent paper that I published together with Pablo and Mireya not only on how relevant, and here on the slide, you can see the reasons why the research based on using evidence-based food security scale is important for policy making, but especially because these scales have the capacity to actually classify households according to level of severity. So not only is it food secure or food insecure, but if it's food insecure, how food insecure is a household matters enormously. So you can imagine that uh, these findings are very crucial for countries to better target, uh, design, and evaluate their food security programs. Next, please. So uh, to start my conclusions, uh, evidence-based uh, scales indeed yields a smart indicator that has a strong potential to help improve uh, food security governance. And what we have learned uh, with the experience uh, of uh, EVIA 
in, uh, in Brazil or the introduction of ELSA in Mexico, for example, when it comes to food security governance, the process of how the experience-based skills are introduced uh, into the countries matter as much as the instrument itself. So having an inclusive a whole of society approach when these scales are introduced, it really makes a huge difference on whether they will end up having a, a value for policy making or not. Next, please. And a, at the end of the day, this is like, you know, the what we say in the US, the icing on the cake, when a, finally the eight adult questions from ELSA became essentially the questions that are the basis for the food insecurity experience scale that now is used by FAO through Gallup polls all over the world to track one of the key sustainable development goals and targets related to, to food insecurity. And the ELSA team was very, very engaged and involved advising FAO throughout this process and we feel immensely proud of it. And as you know, you know, this is now taking us to the era of how evidence-based food security skills can influence policy, not only at the national, but also at the global level. Next, please. So to conclude, the experience-based skills have a very strong potential to improve food security governance when there is the political will as shown in the natural experiment in Brazil to address uh, social inequities. Uh, they can help with better intersectoral planning, improve accountability as it's, it's now happening to President Bolsonaro as a result of the results from EVIA, even before COVID, but also during uh, the COVID pandemic, he has to, to do something about it. Uh, it is also important to mention that it has performed very well at the municipal level, uh, the, the, the indicator, the metric generated from, from these scales. So the ability to help guide a targeting evaluation and planning from the national to the municipal level, I would say is the next phase of research that should be done with ELSA and other experience-based scales, both at the local as well as at the global level. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Rafael. It's fascinating to uh, recall the, the history of the ELCSA and actually your work attests to the huge impact of, of the ELCSA scale. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just a quick reminder for the audience, we will be collecting all your, uh, all your questions that you post either in the chat or the Q&A, and at the end we will address them uh, with, a, with a whole panel. Now we will move on to uh, Mireya Vilar Comte, uh, her work focuses on health inequities and early life health determinants and the translation of this research into feasible and evidence-based interventions. She has performed extensive research in the area of food insecurity, including psychometric validations and adaptations of the Latin American and Caribbean food security scale, the ELCSA, uh, and also food insecurity during crisis and emergencies. And she has worked on the interplay between the urban poverty and food insecurity amongst many other topics. So uh, Mireya, please go ahead. Thank you so much, Pablo, for the kind introduction and um, um, hello, everyone. Um, so if I can move to the next slide, please. So what I wanna do today, it's um, pretty much first um, understand the intersection between food insecurity and public health emergencies, and then go into looking at what has happened during the pandemic uh, in Mexico. So I will provide some context in terms of the, um, the, the country, in terms of uh, the pandemic in Mexico. And then I will drive you through how um, did we design a tracking system for food insecurity. I will show you the trends and analysis we've performed. And I will uh, especially talk about challenges and, and lessons of this tracking uh, during the pandemic about food insecurity that will drive us to um, some thoughts about future, the future agenda. And if we could move to the next one. Um, so, you know, just to make sure that we are all on the same um, ground, so public health emergency, actually, it's the occurrence or uh, imminent threat of an illness or a health condition caused by an epidemic, pandemic, or novel agent. So I think that 
at this stage, we are pretty much familiar with what a public health emergency looks like. But if I can go to the next one, um, the next slide. Um, what I want to highlight is that public health emergencies, as the one that we are facing today, actually tend to affect economic growth, also affect employment, income of households and individuals, which obviously leads to um, increasing poverty and decreasing equity. It may affect food production and distribution and altogether have health and well being effects. And all of these actually, um, one of the things that um, it actually leads to, it's to uh, stressing out food insecurity. So if we can move to the next one. So this is the reason what we actually um, decided to assess if measuring food insecurity through the ELCSA. Um, but now with a telephone survey, it's valid and reliable during a public health emergency in a low and middle income country. And also to study how the COVID pandemic um, is associated with food insecurity in Mexico, which is a high middle income country. And if I can go to the next slide, please. Um, so just to give you a heads up a bit, a bit of context about Mexico, it has about 125 million inhabitants. It's, as I was mentioning, a high middle income country with a per capita GDP of about 20,000. Um, it's a highly unequal country, and we can see that through the Gini coefficient, uh, which is close to five. And during the pandemic, it's been the fourth country with the highest mortality, um, that it's about uh, 250,000 um, 250, um, deaths now. Um, and it's, it's actually the excess mortality analysis, it drives to high far, um, you know, it's like uh, uh, greater estimates. And as today, um, we are about a 26% uh, coverage of fully vaccinated. Um, so just going back to what I was mentioning that the uh, COVID pandemic has affected food insecurity, in Mexico, it's been particularly important as food insecurity, it's part of an official indicator of the multidimensional poverty measurement, which is the official poverty measurement, and it speaks about the relevance of food insecurity governments that uh, Rafael was mentioning before. So it's the reason why we thought it was particularly important to track food insecurity. So if I can move to the next slide. So, um, you know, just to give you an idea of the waves that Mexico has been through with the pandemic, we are clearly into the third wave. Um, and um, on, the, on the left, we are seeing the daily cases in Mexico. On the left, the new deaths in Mexico. Um, I mean, just um, highlighting that the scales um, in the axis are very different uh, in both the scales. So it's the reason why uh, they look somehow um, different now but um you know it's like you can see that that they are pretty reflective uh, of um three waves so that's something that i want you to keep in mind so if i can move to the next one so in mexico um as i was mentioning before uh food insecurity is part of the um poverty measurement like the official poverty measurement and to do so um national surveys collect constantly this information about food insecurity through two um, surveys. One is the National Income and Expenditure Survey that it's called ENIC. And um, they actually use a subset of the ELCSA, that it's the EMSA, that it's a, a Mexican food security scale, um, you know, that it's, it's a subset of the ELCSA and it's collected face to face. And this is actually the main instrument for measuring food insecurity for purposes of the um, uh, poverty, multidimensional poverty um, uh, official measurement in Mexico. And the second survey, it's the National Survey of Health and Nutrition, um, that they do use the full um, ELCSA. And, um, you know, this is a very fine instrument that it's, it was, it, it's now it's collected on a uh, constant basis, although at some time it was collected every six years. So something that it was really worrisome at the early stages of the pandemic, it's that the National Bureau of Statistics announced that the pandemic would affect data collection, um, which means that, you know, it's like food insecurity information would not be collected amongst others. So if we can move to the next one. So a group of researchers led by the uh, Research Center for Equitable Development, EQUIDE at Universidad Iberoamericana, actually decided to uh, fill this gap of information really early on in the pandemic. And in April, 2020, we actually launched the COVID-19 survey. Uh, the COVID-19 survey, it's a telephone uh, nationally representative survey of Mexican adults. 
um, who have a mobile phone. And it's a good sampling frame because in Mexico, the coverage of mobile phones, it, it's close to 96%. And um, the, the survey was actually one stage stratified probabilistic sampling of um, mobile telephone. And our um, sampling frame was the national dialing uh, plan. So, you know, it's like, it's, it's a pretty um, robust um, framework. So, and we actually use sampling weights to correct for minor deviations from the Mexican population demographic structure using census data. So um, something that I wanna brought to your attention, if you recall from the prior slide, both Ensanut and Anik, the two large surveys had collected EXA or EMSA through face-to-face. -face. So uh, it, this was uh, through the end of it was the first time that we would collect data through uh, ELSA data through telephone in Mexico. So that was a substantial issue that we were worried about. Can you move to the next one, please? Okay, so um, I will go back to this issue of the, of the telephone uh, uh, collection of the ELXA, but let me just give you a brief um, notion of how this um, survey worked. We actually, at the beginning, as many of us thought that this pandemic was gonna be a, a short-term um, aspect or, or thing. So we decided to do a cross-sectional um, survey in April, and then we repeated it in May. And as we saw how this pandemic was evolving, we actually decided to feel that June, July, and August, these are uh, repeated cross-sections, because it's not uh, panel data, it's, it's cross-sectional data, then October, December, and March 21. So we have a pretty robust uh, tracking system uh, of food insecurity, among other indicators. Um, but something that is important, it's that between April and May, we needed to do lots of adaptation and validation analysis due to this issue of the telephone use for the first time. Then, you know, it's like we also pay attention to tracking the prevalence throughout the pandemic. And um, we also looked at um, trying to understand the association of the, of the pandemic with food insecurity and the contribution of pre-COVID uh, vulnerability. And then in October, around October, um, you know, the National Bureau of Statistics and, and the National uh, Public Health um, Institute restarted collecting some of these major surveys and uh, publicly um, giving up data. So, you know, it's like Ensanut and Anuk, and Anuk then resumed data collection, and this actually called for further validation analysis of the, um, of the telephone survey. So this is what I'm going to be discussing today. And um, if we can move to the next one. So I will start by the adaptation and validation analysis. So um, in April 2020, when we filled it for the first time, we used exactly the 16 item ELXA that had been used, for example, in Ensanut before. But by May 2020, we actually were quite puzzled about um, two aspects. One, it's the uh, framing that it's in terms of wording, it's, it's lengthy. So we actually, together with Rafael um, and, and Pablo, uh, we did a, sh a slightly shorter wording of the, of, the, um, of the items. And we also decided to move as, as the yes um, uh, or the FAO um, uh, measurement to eight items. So we respected the time framework from the ELXA, we respected uh, how it was um, framed mostly in terms of language, but we only included uh, the eight adult items by May 2020. And we did a bunch of um, measurement and, and psychometric validity to make sure that this was capturing correctly the, um, the, the construct of food insecurity. And if you're interested, this actually was published in Public Health Nutrition in, in the paper that I'm showing here. So if we can move to the next one. So pretty much what we've been doing since then, it's actually doing rash modeling for every cross-section and um, what we and comparing it to the 2018 um, Ensanut measurement, which is like the gold standard for, for a, a nationally representative survey. And what we've done, seen, it's like, um, you know, the, the telephone survey, it's, it's quite valid and reliable, you know, it's like, and um, we, we can see that through severity, um, the severity scores per item and the infit values per item. There is one month in which we are having a problem with the infit value um, for, um, I think it, it was May, but, you know, it's like, I think that the, the, the more we train um, interviewers, also, uh, the better these uh, questions were uh, performing. So we've been doing this rash modeling constantly to make sure that our tracking system is consistent and it has um, robust um, psychometric properties. So if we can move to the next one, please. 
at the same time, it was really important to see the convergent validity in terms of showing how our measurements of uh, food insecurity through the telephone survey were consistent with uh, what we would expect. For example, in the first um, graph, we are showing how um, higher income uh, have almost no severe and, and moderate food insecurity, and they are mainly food secure. And as we move um, to lower socioeconomic standard levels, this uh, picture actually flips around. And um, the same we were able to do it with some um, um, mental health um, uh, question items, for instance, the, the uh, anxiety symptoms, um, and we also see the same. So as you're food secure, your, your anxiety symptoms are lower. As you become severe food insecure, this actually uh, becomes worse. So I think that um, with these adaptations and validations, we were quite certain that um, the use of the of the ELCS as we were doing through the telephone and with the eight items was performing quite well. If we can move to the next one, please. And um, you know, just to give you a heads up in terms of tracking of prevalence, so we had these repeated cross sections, and it was really important to actually um, do a good. Um, we became, especially uh, Ikida became an outlet of, uh, you know, publicly stating what was going on with food insecurity in Mexico. And actually Ikida led um, the generation of policy briefs in press conferences. And many of, um, of, of us, uh, Pablo and, and Rafael, we, we collaborated in some of them. And, you know, it's like, and it's something that Ikida did very rightly. It's like they partner with um, different organizations for these policy briefs and press conferences such as, um, you know, it's like NGOs, international organization, other um, local and, and international organizations. So most of this information is um, available online, um, including the press conferences. If we can move to the next one, please. And um, just to give you a heads up on the trends that we are seeing when we are tracking. So this dot over here, it's in Sanut, that it's pre-pandemic. And um, so the food security, was um, you know it's like at forty about around forty five percent, and as we can see early in the pandemic, it really declined all the way to twenty some around twenty six percent in July, and um, it this sort of makes sense because these these were the most um, stringent lockdown measures. Then it improved again, and then in December that we actually saw in January and February one of the worst peaks of the pandemic it declined again to 27%. So um, this trend actually makes sense with what we are mirroring with the, with the waves. If we can go to the next one, please. Uh, um, and this one over here, it's actually the same time series, but with the three levels of severity of food insecurity. So the one in yellow, it's, um, lo, it's um, moderate food, in, uh, sorry, <laughs> mild food insecurity that we see a pattern that it increased probably as uh, food security was dropping, my food insecurity was increasing and that it improved again. And um, then the one in gray, it's actually the moderate food security that it, it has like a very hazardous uh, trend. You know, it's like, it's not clear, it goes up and down. And I think it's because how the process of food insecurity happens over time. And something that is really worrisome, it's seeing how food, uh, sorry, um, severe food insecurity has been increasingly slowly, but thoroughly throughout the pandemic. And now uh, in, in March, 2021, we actually reported at 17%. If we can move to the next one, please. So, um, you know, it's like this tracking has actually led to um, a lot of um, media coverage. Um, and, you know, it's like I'm just mentioning this and uh, I will return to this in, in my one of my last slides. If we can move to the next one, please. So um, we have also done this analysis to see the associations of food insecurity and the pandemic. And actually, we have already one paper out there um, that it's under review at the International Journal for Equity and Health. If we can move to the next one, please. And in this paper, we actually uh, look at data from April to August, and we selected this time frame because this is when the tracking was monthly. And what we see is, um, uh, you know, it's like controlling for key covariates. We actually see a decrease, a constant and significant decrease in food insecurity, a constant and significant increase in um, mild food insecurity. We don't see a, a, a clear trend in moderate food insecurity. We do see a trend in increasing constant food, uh, severe food insecurity, 
although it is not um, yet uh, significant by August, um, my hunch is that if we do this analysis all the way to March, this would become uh, statistically significant. And um, something that I'm not showing here, but it's very worrisome, it's that, for example, uh, there is a gender gap in which uh, women are constantly um, more affected in household with children as well. So if we can move to the next one, please. Okay, so lastly, the, the last part that, you know, it's like how, how we compare our data with Ensanud and Amigas, the, they presume collecting and, pub and publishing data. If we can move to the next one. Okay, so this is highly important for us because uh, remember that this is the first time that ELSA has been actually collected by phone. So um, the red orange uh, bars are the in COVID, the um, you know, yellowish ones are ENIC and the um, green ones are in Sanud. So as we can see, you know, we are not identical, none of us, you know, it's identical, but the trends are pretty much similar. You know, it's like the, in, 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 in seeing, you know, um, the decrease per, and this is per items, I'm sorry, these are the eight items that um, we've been measuring and we did the, the same analysis for um, each of the surveys. It might seem that we overestimate a bit food insecurity um, with uh, the, the end COVID, and there might be some reasons for this that I will address in a second, but you know, it's like this, uh, most of them actually uh, fall within the, the, in, the interval confidence that are shown in, in the bars. So, um, and just um, one quick thing that I did not mention, it's that the, in COVID, we actually put together all the cross sections to do this analysis because um, these surveys look at a full year. So I, I think it makes sense to do this, but you know, it's like there is still a lot of, of analysis that we need to do here, but it doesn't look disastrous. You know, like there are uh, small variations, but um, I think that overall the ELXA through the phone, it's performing well. So can we move to the next one? So, um, you know, wrapping up, I think that, um, you know, going to the, 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 the aims, the, the ELXA, it's, it's a valid and feasible tool to use in the phone and with these eight um, um, items that I've mentioned before, there are some challenges and lessons. So one, it's like the time constraints actually led us to the eight items. So we dropped the 16 item ones. Then the other one is that the respondent, um, we don't know what's the role it has within the household and it's responding for the household. So that, that might be something imp important. Then I wanna pick up the location of the scale within the questionnaire. So right now, uh, the questionnaire inquires a lot about um, aspects about income, access to healthcare, um, employment, mental health, and so on. And the very last, uh, one, one of the very last uh, um, scales, it's the ELXA. So we think that, you know, it's like we might have reminded people how uh, bad, you know, they, they, what a bad time they are having with the pandemic. And they may actually be, um, you know, reporting or being affected when they, when they actually respond to scale. The other thing it's, um, you know, it's like interviewer training, I think it's crucial. And there is an issue related to the hard drone effect that we don't know, you know, it's like if by phone, maybe people, it's actually more honest about what, what they are um, going through as they are not seeing you face to face. If we can move to the next one, please. So um, in terms of the, of the association between the pandemic and the emergency, I think that what we are seeing is that the pandemic has produced significant decreases in food insecurity and increases in food insecurity uh, uh, almost you know, through all the severity levels. You know, the moderate one, it has this um, weird pattern that we still need to um, understand. I think it's really worrisome the turn the tendency towards increases in severe food insecurity throughout uh, the pandemic, although not significant yet. And um, the pandemic, I think, it's likely to magnify pre-existing inequities as in Mexico, as we've seen in other countries. And I think that through NCOVID as a continuous monitoring system, we are seeing the dynamic process of food insecurity that we uh, so often, you know, graph from, you know, how you move from food security to severe food insecurity. And now with this constant tracking, I think that we are actually capturing the, the phenomena as a dynamic process. If we move to the next one, and I'm almost finishing, um, I, something that I really want to stress, it's that perhaps, um, you know, it's really important food insecurity is fundamental for, for uh, food insecurity, for food security governments. But we in Mexico, as a group of researchers, have not been able to actually have an impact on policymaking. Since very early in the pandemic, actually with my uh, colleague Rafael and some of my colleagues from uh, uh, Equide, 
we said, you know, we need to have um, investment in, in vulnerable families and nothing happened. We actually costed them for it costed them for them and uh, you know it's like the second graph I'm showing in this it, it's actually taken from from another paper that shows the social additional expenditure that countries in the region have done since the pandemic started Mexico is the worst country it's the worst of all countries so actually you know it's like this is really worrisome that perhaps you know it's like despite being uh, tracking, uh, doing press conferences, publishing papers and so on, we haven't been able to impact policymaking. If we can move to the next one. And you know, just our next agenda, I mean, this policymaking issue, it's, it's really worrisome. And uh, we need to clearly you know, think how we can you know, keep uh, making noise. But in uh, more research terms, I think that we need to assess the association of lockdown and lockdowns and waves with food insecurity using all the full cross-sectional data and um, uh, doing some merge with other um, uh, data sources. And we, I think that we also have a magnificent um, data set to add actually model transitions in food insecurity severity. This is something that we really wanna look at. And then, you know, it's like uh, from a more pragmatical perspective, I think that we need to document the limitations and advantages of tracking food insecurity through telephone surveys, because this is something that really has not been done in the Latin American region. So I think this could be a very important addition. If we move to the next one, please. So I just wanna finish by thanking, especially Equide that has been the leader of this project and um, the Yale School of Public Health, especially Rafael, because he's been such an um, insider in, into um, you know, what to do with the food insecurity through this constant tracking. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mireya. Um, impressive results that you showed us, especially on severe food insecurity, which go uh, along the same lines as the ones Rafael showed on Brazil, and also shameful that um, most of these reports have been largely ignored. Uh, but we'll have a chance to discuss it uh, in a moment. So for now, we will continue uh, with uh, Dr. Telini Agampodi. Uh, she's a professor in social epidemiology and an expert in qualitative health research. She's the lead investigator of validation of self-administered ELXA PSL to assess food insecurity among pregnant women in Sri Lanka. Um, Dilini, please. Uh, thank you, Pablo. Uh, next slide, yeah. So uh, it's great to be here in the webinar. I thank Professor Rafael. And uh, let's uh, share my small experience from Sri Lanka on uh, tracking household food insecurity, and uh, especially validation of ELXA. Uh, we call it now ELXA. PSL, it's of a pregnancy in Sri Lanka. Uh, so I will be discussing, uh, I will be giving a brief introduction to Sri Lanka because it's a very different country from what we were talking about. And then a little bit on food security in uh, pregnancy and the detailed methods on how we validated ELXA PSL in Sri Lanka, the results and the way forward as we are planning. Next slide, please. So Sri Lanka is a tropical country, a small dot in the Indian Ocean. Uh, we have an agricultural based economy. Uh, so we have full of uh, rivers and mountains in the country, uh, a beautiful landscape. Next slide, please. Uh, the Sri Lankan population consists of a sort of multicultural community. Uh, we have Sinhalas, the majority of the country, Sinhala Buddhists, about 70% of the population. Uh, and 77% of the population is considered as rural. Next slide. So Sri Lanka is a democratic socialist republic since 1978. Uh, and uh, we have a GNI per capita of US dollars 4010. And it, uh, Sri Lanka is a lower middle income country. And we spend only 4% of GNP on health expenditure. Next, please. Yeah, so uh, although a small and developing country, our literacy rates are high, uh, both 
among females and males, which uh, was a sort of a trigger to uh, develop a self-administered questionnaire or uh, validated sign and self-administering manner. And uh, our life expectancy at birth is 75.5 years. Uh, and the Gini coefficient is uh, almost similar to Mexico as Maria uh, elaborated. Uh, and the poverty head count is 4.1. Next slide, please. So uh, about the, because the EGSA is for pregnancy in Sri Lanka, uh, I want to talk about a little bit about the maternal nutritional indicators. So we are having uh, the triple burden of malnutrition uh, among mothers and children. As you can see, uh, there is a low BMI, high BMI, percentages are high in a relative manner, and there are micronutrition deficiencies as well. Next slide, please. Uh, but of course, uh, we are uh, in the top in breastfeeding, according to the World Breastfeeding Indicator uh, Trends in the Initiative. Uh, we are the only green country, Sri Lanka was the only green country on breastfeeding. Uh, just to mention the success, right? Next slide, please. Uh, with child nutritional indicators, uh, if you see uh, the wasting percentage, childhood wasting is 15.1% and we are on the top seventh country on wasting. So that is a real problem in Sri Lanka. And again, you, you see the uh, triple burden of malnutrition in children as well. Next slide, please. So talking about food security, so Sri Lanka has a, a very strong history and uh, we were known as the granary of the East in very, very ancient royalty. Uh, but now it's a, we are uh, really facing problems. Next slide, please. So the accounts on food security in Sri Lanka. So this is uh, the FAO uh, analysis, uh, I think using the FISA tool. So it indicates that uh, severe food security is 7.1% and moderate to severe 17.7%. So you can see compared to US and uh, compared to India, our position. And in Sri Lanka, the main drivers of food insecurity is known to be poverty, uh, then the climate sensitivity or seasonal patterns, and the limited uh, production of own food and low food diversification of a uh, low diversification of livelihoods. Next slide, please. Right. So coming back to uh, food insecurity in pregnancy. So when you go through literature, there is a lot of evidence synthesis on food insecurity in pregnancy. So in among pregnant mothers, food insecurity is uh, associated with a lot of social determinants. So ethnicities, uh, marital status, education, and poor social classes, and uh, I have to say now, even in uh, the Sri Lankan population where we did the validation study, of course, I, I cannot talk about the results because it's just a validation study, but then it is very much associations, uh, show very much, a lot of associations, it's social capital in pregnancy. And uh, as uh, Maria mentioned, um, food insecurity is associated with maternal depression, high maternal stress levels, and also with biological factors, obesity and overweight, both excessive weight gain and uh, poor weight gain in pregnancy according to the different countries. And also it's, it is associated with gestational diabetes mellitus, and also uh, it affects pregnancy outcomes, uh, specifically severe food security, I would mention, not moderate or mild food insecurity uh, is associated with uh, preterm birth and low birth weight. Next slide, please. So this is uh, about the validation of LXRPSL. So uh, with Professor Rafael's uh, cooperation and cordial uh, cooperation, uh, we have been uh, sort of adopting LXR to include it, to measure food insecurity in a self-administered manner among pregnant women. So the tool uh, 
administered or the validation was conducted in the Rajarata pregnancy cohort study. So the Rajarata pregnancy cohort is the largest pregnancy cohort in Sri Lanka. And when I met uh, Professor Raphael, so the pregnancy cohort was at the third trimester in their pregnancy, these mothers. So it was a huge study. But then, uh, so we administered, started administering the uh, ELXA tool after translation and validation as a validation tool uh, uh, for the third trimester mothers in pregnancy. And uh, as you can see, these are the publications uh, on the validation study and the protocol of the Rajarati pregnancy cohort. So during the validation, uh, we translated the tool and uh, we conducted both cognitive validation and psychometric validation. Next slide, please. So uh, going into the details of validation, so eight panelists uh, participated who were fluent in all languages. Uh, so we translated to Sinhala and Tamil, uh, participated in translation and we used the Sumatipala and Murray's method for translation. Then the cognitive validation uh, we conducted in an expert group and also in the target group. So uh, five experts on uh, scale development methodology, maternal health, public health, social determinants of health and nutrition participates in the expert panel. And they uh, went through each item and gave, gave their uh, opinion on improving or adapting the scale to pregnancy and to the Sri Lankan uh, community. And after that, uh, with the corrections, we put it into pregnant mothers and uh, we adopted the Borden and uh, Fox Rushby method on cognitive validation, where uh, it is a three step process. And where we first uh, administered, asked the mothers to read and uh, answer the question each item and we uh, detected whether it is easily understood and whether the mother can answer very easily and directly and then we inquired about the cognitive process that is generated in the mother's mind when answering each item right so we were asking okay what 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 are you imagining when you are we ask the question? So why do we did this? So just to see whether the intended meanings, the original intended meanings of Elksa is preserved in the mother's mind and the mother interpret it in the same manner as the investigator need to do it. And then we also ask about the suggestions from the mothers, uh, whether they need uh, different uh, wordings, phrases, or uh, as such to improve the scale. So it was a, a very sort of a comprehensive uh, procedure of co cognitive validation. Next step, next slide, please. Right, then uh, the cognitively validated tool was uh, incorporated into the uh, RAPCO study for a psychometric validation. Uh, so we, ad we were able to administer the tool for 269 mothers only because we have to hold, unfortunately, hold the RAPCO study because of the COVID-19 pandemic as it was a community-based uh, study. So, but anyway, uh, with this lot, with this sample, we were able to conduct the validation uh, of the tool. So we assess model fit using uh, one parameter logistic model, RASH model, as mentioned by Mariah, also in Sri Lanka. And the item severity and uh, scores uh, were assessed. I have to mention um, Amber here, Amber Hiromi Fielder, who helped in analysis uh, at Yale. And also we assess concurrent validity using the general health questionnaire 12. Uh, so that is uh, for psychological distress. Next slide, please. So these are some pics of administering and cognitive validation. Next slide, please. So the results of cognitive validation. So uh, according to the expert opinion, the inter because now this was a self-administered questionnaire and I think this is the first time that ELPSA was uh, made a self-reported uh, questionnaire tool. Uh, so the lay language 
was easily so the expert's opinion was that uh, for us to use the lay language which is easily understood by women in rural communities so as you know now by now uh, sri lanka is 77% uh, rural and we clearly mentioned that the lack of access to food was being asked in the context of lack of uh, socio-economic resources and not due to dieting or loss of social appetite or pregnancy related symptoms. So this is very important when you translate the questionnaire or adapt it for pregnancy because many mothers do not uh, take food due to nausea and vomiting and heartburn and so on. And then uh, we used repeated phrases because this is self-administered, even in the item, uh, by item we used, uh, uh, okay, during the past three months, because we want to focus uh, the participant on this and say due to the non-availability of food. So these phrases were repeatedly used to make the participant, keep the participant in focus. So when we administered this to the target group, it was really clear to them and the intended meanings were preserved. Next slide, please. So these are the baseline characteristics of the 269 participants. So majority aged between 19 to 35 years and majority mothers were in signal ethnicity group. And most of the mothers uh, had post-primary education. Our response rate was 82%. Uh, only a small amount of missing uh, data was there. And although this is a small sample, this is a sort of a district representative sample as it represented uh, 21 out of 22 uh, MOH areas. MOH is the uh, medical administrative area, public health administrative area in the district uh, uh, in, in the Anuradhapura district. Next slide, please. So as you can see, this is the uh, the internal consistency was good. Cronbach's Con alpha was 0 0.7. Then the psychometric properties uh, when you put the model and uh, if you can see the table. So the most severe item or the most item affirmed by most of the people was uh, the run out of food diversity which is a little bit different than other communities i guess because it's before it came before fear of run out of food so this fact i think this need to be uh, further studied through qualitative techniques why this happened and the second was fear uh, of run out of food and then run out of food next slide please so these are the uh, other psychometric properties, the infest statistics, as you see, uh, I'm sorry for the uh, small letters, but then the uh, order of severity is as I mentioned, and the item fist statistics was uh, fulfilled to uh, accommodate the uh, RASH model. Next slide, please. So this is about the concurrent validity using psychological distress. So uh, as you know, these social uh, and psychological uh, correlations are very small, but although it's a small correlation, it was a positive correlation with GHQ. And uh, when we go back in analysis of RAPCO, the food insecurity uh, uh, scores were actually uh, co actually, they correlated with the uh, first and second, even with first and second trimester uh, uh, mental health scores. So that I have to mention, but I did not want to present it because this is only a, was only a validation study. Next slide, please. So this is about the further inquiry needed on uh, be the diversity of food being the most prominent in Sri Lanka. So uh, actually, if you can see now, these are the different types of vegetables and uh, nutritious food in a plate of a pregnant mother. So these are self-drawn diagrams of usual diet plates in pregnancy, which was carried out in the cohort in the first trimester uh, for a different purpose or for an anemia study. But if you can see, uh, what you meant by lack of dietary diversity. So the plate consists of a full meal of carbohydrates and one or one or two vegetables. So that is the problem. So uh, 
when validating or when refining a XA, we would have to think of whether uh, it represents the habitual uh, lack of diversity or whether it really uh, represents the diversity due to lack of food insecurity. So these are the uh, minor, actually minor comments uh, that would help to refine a tool more and more uh, for the future. Next slide, please. So, uh, because diversity, lack of diversity is very well documented in Sri Lanka. So you see in other studies done in the past, lack of fruits and vegetables in the meal and lack of uh, dairy foods, that is well documented. So we have to investigate further on this aspect. Next slide, please. Right, so way forward, uh, uh, unfortunately, due to the pandemic and all the constraints, uh, we have not been able to uh, adopt the adopt EXA in a tracking manner, as Maria, Maria mentioned. Uh, but then uh, we are we have plans in Sri Lanka to uh, validate the ch children's items uh, and use it for children's households as well, and also. Uh, uh, try to build the association with responsive feeding. So that study is being conducted at the moment. And also uh, after the fourth wave of COVID where the RAPCO mothers, the pregnancy cohort will be again established with the infant cohort, we are planning to uh, adopt the EPSA for the households. Next slide, please. Yes, these are a few of the references. Next slide. Right, so I thank uh, so much for Professor Rafael for engaging me in the webinar as well as all this uh, important work. It has been a very great experience. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Delini. It was um, a very interesting study and very detailed. I especially enjoyed the diagrams of like, showing the lack of diversity in, in the plates. Thank you very thank much. You. Um, I will now uh, give a, a short commentary that tries to sum up some of the contributions of the ELCSA to food insecurity monitoring and policy making. Um, and afterwards, we will go on to the Q&A. Uh, first, I want to highlight uh, so, some of the things that were uh, stressed out today. First, uh, there is a wide measurement consensus on experience-based food insecurity scales. I mean, what, what we're listening is that uh, the ELCSA is valid, is reliable, and it's feasible. It's, uh, um, as Mireya showed, it's easy to, uh, to implement it in different kinds of, uh, of contexts. And uh, in all those contexts you, context, you get high quality measures. So we know that the ELCSA scale is robust uh, throughout its uh, different versions. Uh, Rafael shows that it goes, it starts from the AVIA, then you could find it in the ELCSA, now in the PS, so different um, uh, presentations of the scale all keep uh, some high quality uh, characteristics. But we also know that the scale is robust across modalities. Uh, we know that it works face to face, but Talini shows that it also works in a self administered way. Mireya showed us that it works in a telephone modality, and uh, it's becoming more common to see even online modalities. We also know that it's robust across countries. So uh, we know that we can see estimates in high income countries, middle income countries and low income countries, and it's not a, a phenomenon that it's exclusive to middle or low income countries, but uh, we can see and compare estimates along different types of countries. But we also know that it, it's robust to multi level measurements. Uh, we, we've seen that you can measure it at the municipal level, but also national level, regional level, and as FAO has shown recently, you can even see it at a, a global level. So uh, what I'm going, uh, what I mean is that the ELCSA uh, provides comparable estimates of food insecurity, uh, and, and you can do cross-national comparisons, and also that the ELCSA provides estimates that are useful for many types of stakeholders at different levels. So uh, it is a test of the robustness of the ELCSA from a measurement perspective. Uh, a second point I want to stress is that there's a lot of evidence on, on its risk factors and the consequences. Uh, Talini pr uh, presented some of the drivers, of so the general drivers, including poverty, climate, characteristics of food systems. Also, media showed how, why do we expect food insecurity to increase during uh, disasters or different types of crisis. 
But we also know some, uh, we have a lot of evidence on some of its consequences. We know uh, it, it affects health outcomes. We know it's important for chronic diseases, for mental health, but also uh, for premature mortality. But especially, we, can, we know that we can use the ELXA to study at-risk populations. Uh, we, we've seen it, how it measures uh, households with children. Uh, Talini also showed us uh, its impact or its importance on pregnant women. But we also have evidence on uh, how it can be used to understand the elders or uh, job disruptions like the unemployed uh, between low-income populations. Uh, so what we know is that the ELXA is suitable to assess at-risk populations and also to evaluate interventions. No? So we have a, a very robust tool to use it in different kinds of, of contexts and circumstances. And also a focus on the food insecurity levels give us uh, this detailed or granular information uh, that can even offer us those response patterns, which are very useful to understand um, like a progress uh, in um, when we are monitoring food insecurity. Uh, and the third point I want to, to highlight is that uh, the ELXA provides key information for policy decisions. We know that the estimates provided by the ELXA are sensitive to shocks and to time. I mean, we know, as Mireya showed us, that when we are monitoring food insecurity, we can see the, the effects of uh, disasters such as COVID, but also, as Rafael uh, showed us, it's also sensitive to policy modifications as the, one we, as the ones we saw in Brazil. So it's important, uh, it's valuable to establish this measurement, uh, these monitoring systems using the ELXA. It gives us uh, important information on some of the impacts when some of these crises uh, occur. Also, we know, as Rafael stressed out, that good measurement is not enough. We, uh, advances in food insecurity cannot be taken for granted. Uh, we saw that in, in Brazil when there were great improvements um, at the beginning, but nowadays uh, hunger is coming back. Mireya also make a good point on how in Mexico, they're ignoring some of these reports, these worrisome reports, especially on the increases of severe food insecurity. So we also know that we need to strengthen food security governance at different levels. Uh, we need to, to, to keep working on local initiatives, but also on policy advocacy at, uh, at a larger level. Um, so I think that these three points were clearly uh, expressed in, the, in today's presentations, which is the measurement consensus, the, the bulk of evidence on the risk factor and its consequences, especially with at-risk populations, but also the need to strengthen food security governance to, uh, if we really want to reduce food insecurity uh, globally. Um, and now just, um, I want to end my commentary with uh, stressing some pending issues with the ELXA. Maybe this could serve as triggers for the Q&A. So uh, for the panelists, if you wanna pick up wherever you want, please feel free. Um, I want to, to mention some of the pending issues uh, regarding uh, what I mentioned on the measurement consensus. Uh, first, uh, I feel that there's uh, still some discussion on the level of measurement of food insecurity. Uh, we, we know that the ELXA is measuring at the household level, but sometimes the, uh, the fees would be measured at the individual level. So it might be some discussion on what's, what's the impact of changing the, the measurement level there. Also the time frame. some of the, uh, the versions use the, the three months as the ELXA uh, stresses, but other food insecurity measures uh, prefer the 30 days time frame. And also, I think there's an, an open discussion on, on the number of items. And as, as, the, as a member of the audience already pointed out, we're, we're sometimes using the adults-only version, and sometimes we're using the full version, including the children items. So uh, I think this uh, warrants a little bit more of discussion on the, on the pros and cons of these choices. And also, I think there's an, an, an open issue about how do we update the ELXA? Uh, as, as Talini showed, we sometimes need adaptations to special populations and in special contexts, particularly with, um, for, for example, the experience with indigenous populations that it has been proven to, to be useful, but sometimes, uh, uh, but th this should not be taken for granted for all indigenous populations. Also, we may need to assess time invariance and also um, include another dimensions of, uh, of food insecurity. I'm thinking uh, the consumption of nutritious food, but also uh, adding new components 
and I'm thinking especially on associated phenomena such as water security. And this could be like ways of improving or expanding the research on food insecurity. But um, th that's uh, all for my part. And I think we're ready to move on to the Q&A. Um, I'm gonna just uh, read some of the questions that, that have arrived to the chat and the Q&A. But uh, I encourage the audience to write all your questions in the Q&A button. Uh, so um, let me start with one that Rafael already answered in the chat, but maybe he wants to, to expand some of it. Uh, it. It's a question from Beatrice Rogers that says that one of the, that she calls it one of the main differences between HFIA, scale and EXA, was the inclusion of food, of food safety. Yes, Pablo, thank you very much, Pia, for, for the question. And indeed, you know, we were very interested in adding a food safety submodule uh, to the ELXA, and we tried uh, in different countries, but the conclusion was that it would require a whole, the development of a whole new scale. And thankfully, we now have a, a very good a water security scale, household water security scale, that is called HWISE. And the lead developer of that scale is Sira Young from Northwestern University. And we're very happy that a, the ELSA Mexico team has established now a partnership with, a, a, with Northwestern to actually start validating it in, in Mexico as well. So at the very least, a, as we know, food safety issues, a lot of them have to do with water. So at the very least, we will be able to start capturing that dimension pretty soon. Over to you, Pablo. Thank you, Rafael. Uh, let's continue with a question addressed to Mireya. Uh, would you be able to speak to why the team moved from the 16 item ELXA in April 2020 to an eight item ELXA from May 2020 onward? Was this an adaptation that arose from the administering the survey via phones? Mireya? Yes, thank you, Pablo. I think that's a great question. And actually it speaks about um, how uh, the and COVID-19 started. So, you know, it's like, this is March, 2020. We want to get into the field very fast. So we only wanted to get validated items first. So we actually took the items from ENSANUD, the National um, uh, Health and, and Nutrition Survey, and we, you know, translated them into the, the uh, uh, you know, uh, questionnaire for the, the uh, telephone survey. So by May, we um, observed two things. So, you know, it's like telephone surveys need to be as quick as possible. And we wanted to measure several things. I mean, food security was one of them, but, you know, th there was a lot of competing needs. And um, on the one hand, and on the other hand, it, it just seemed like it was too long for the telephone administration. So we actually sat together a Kida's team with um, uh, Yale's team in, and we decided to cut it down to the eight adult ones. And we did some minor adaptations into the language to make it shorter. And um, it's the reason that we actually uh, reassess the rash modeling, um, you know, twice, you know, it's like in, well, we actually repeated several times. So yeah, it was, it actually, it became part of the um, time constraint on the one hand, and um, also, you know, observing that perhaps these 16 items, uh, the wording as they were, they were just too long for the for the telephone administration. But I don't know, Pablo, if you want to add something to this, because you were also part of this decision making process. Sure, thank you. I, I just want to add that uh, we cross validated this analysis uh, uh, with also the large surveys, the, the ones Mireya mentioned, uh, the Ensenut and the ENIG, and we basically compared uh, what would happen, how much information would you lose if you keep the eight item uh, version of the ELXA against the 16 item ELXA? And what happened especially in uh, households with children? And what we found is that we were uh, losing uh, really a negligible part of the, of the information. So I think it's a, a really good option when you have uh, time constraints or money constraints in your, uh, in your survey. Okay, um, so uh, 
just a reminder to the to the audience if you want to post uh, some q a uh, the questions in the q a section please go ahead we will be discussing them um so uh, i'm just gonna make a question to talini uh, i was very interested on the on the detailed process of validating the the elsa uh, on pregnant women in sri lanka could you tell us a little bit more if you felt that uh, uh, about the, the the feedback you received from uh, from the women, and if you felt that you needed to add something to the to the wording of the Elsa? Uh, thank, thanks, Pamela. It, it's a, a really important question. Again, so uh, I would say now it's not the elements of EXA that needed to change, but uh, when we adopt it for uh, from the general population to pregnant mothers, so the language uh, here in Sri Lanka, when even when we do health education and when we uh, produce booklets for mothers, we use a very soft language, uh, a very emotional language uh, for pregnant mothers. Uh, I think from the culture itself, uh, pregnancy is very protected here and everyone looks after pregnant mothers. So that is the only thing that we needed to change. And we tried to use, uh, so from the experts also, we tried to, we went over and over again in this translation to find the most simple, most simple words so that the mothers would understand. So when it came to mothers for cognitive validation, actually, uh, there was very little correction to be made. They really understood it and it was not a burden to them. So it took only very few minutes to just strike off the questions. Uh, and it was a really good experience. I hope it answers. Yes, yes, very interesting, Delini. Thank you. Uh, we have another question. Uh, uh, what are strengths and limitations of ELXA uh, over other uh, food insecurity tools, especially in this pandemic setting? I can start, Pablo, if you want. Please. So I think that one of the major um, contributions of ELXA for tracking food insecurity during the pandemic is its validation. So we know that the language is understood. We know that it captures the, 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 the construct that it's supposed to be uh, measuring. And uh, we also know that it's very uh, sensitive to changes. You know, as Rafael, for example, was uh, showing um, in Brazil. So I think that that actually led to uh, picking ELXA as the um, default option. Um, and I think it's proving to be very useful um, for tracking and monitoring. Uh, what it has not been able, it's to call the attention of policymakers, but I do think that that's a different uh, phenomenon and that's a different problem. But um, over to you, Pablo, in case anyone wants to um, add. Um, so the, the only thing uh, I also wanted to, to add uh, to Mireya's excellent, uh, excellent response is that I think uh, what distinguishes a lot from other measures uh, is that it is uh, regionally harmonized and now globally harmonized through FIES. So I think that uh, that is a, a very important uh, credential for any measurement scale to have. And most of us always dream and aspire to end up with a scale that is harmonized this way. So I want to brag a little bit about it because I, I think many, many, many years of work from many, many people from many countries went into it so that the world could, could have a harmonized measure. Over to you. Of course, Rafael, it is important. It's, it is worth showing uh, the importance of this, uh, of the history of ELXA. Talini, do you want to add something on the strengths and limitations of the ELSA and why you chose uh, uh, to use that? Yeah, one? so uh, actually, as I mentioned, because I was presenting only the validation study, I did not want to go into the associations even from the validation study. So, uh, but although 
actually I was analyzing the first trimester and second trimester social determinants with the available uh, EUXA data. And it was very interesting to find that uh, the social factors such as domestic cohesion, uh, then social support, even um, emotional support. So they all uh, had an association, a significant association with the, even in this small sample. So uh, maybe in the future, we will be doing it in a larger scale and it will be producing a lot of data. Uh, so uh, I would add, like to add the validity. So it represents valid validity. So the domestic cohesion, uh, the social support, and um, yeah, and even the biological parameters uh, such as uh, uh, I would say systolic blood pressure and so on. So at the moment with a small sample, we cannot uh, sort of elaborate or explain these things, but it's really good to study this, how uh, uh, an instrument developed in far away in the world, how it applies to another country and how it performs, it's, it's really amazing. Yes, it is indeed amazing. Um, now, there's, here's a question for Rafael. Uh, can you expand on the application of the ELXA or any experience-based food insecurity scale at subnational levels, particularly for studies wanting to describe food insecurity severity by place, varying levels of uh, urbanicity? And the question is, has the scale been tested for validity in rural versus urban places? Yes, uh, yes, it has either, uh, uh, I speak about ELSA, I'm also speaking about uh, EVIA, and also about EMSA, the, which are all versions of uh, similar versions. Uh, the one that is used, uh, that is used in Mexico, it has just been done in, in Ecuador uh, as well. So definitely it has been validated urban versus rural areas. It has been validated uh, indigenous versus non-indigenous in the context of uh, you know, indigenous communities or, or people who identify themselves as indigenous uh, living integrated with the whole population. There has been very important work also done with a traditional uh, Aboriginal communities in Brazil led by Ana Maria Segal Correa uh, uh, and also has yielded uh, you know, fairly uh, strong uh, validation for very, very adapted versions from ELSA because, uh, you know, the, the uh, cosmovision of food insecurity and so on is, is very different in those communities and is a much more a community level versus a, only a household level a phenomena. And uh, what has emerged from that work, for example, is that ELSA needs to be supplemented with a concept of ancestral foods. Uh, because people really think that is part of food security to have access to the foods that uh, connect them with their ancestors, even though they may not be healthy from our point of view as public health nutritionists, uh, some, uh, some of them. Uh, so yes, there have been lots and lots of validations and very importantly, the work of Rodrigo Viana in uh, Paraíba in Northeastern Brazil is a beautiful longitudinal story showing how powerful uh, EBIA, uh, which by implication ELSA can be uh, when they are applied at the municipal level for uh, monitoring the impact of policies and how uh, food insecurity changes uh, changes over time. So uh, this work has also been done now in Rio de Janeiro by, uh, uh, by Professor uh, 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 Sales Costa, uh, Rosana Sales Costa, so uh, I would like, as I say, uh, to see more and more of the applications of ELSA uh, going all the way down to the micro municipal level where you know, the frontline uh, work happens when it comes to food security programs. Thank you, Rafael. You're an authentic, you have the authentic encyclopedic knowledge of the ELSA. Uh, <laughs> let me uh, go on to, to another question. Directed to Telimi, uh, how to analyze differentiate that low diversity in consumption, whether it represents uh, habitual food insecurity. For instance, if two individuals only eat two types of food, but one due to habit and one due to food insecurity. And the question continues uh, in two especially vulnerable groups. What if we combine methods to conduct food insecurity survey research in pandemic setting? Is that necessary? 
For instance, what do you think if we combine phone surveys and self-administered survey to pregnant mothers? Thank you, Vanna. Uh, so the first question, uh, how do we uh, see whether the diversity is actually due to uh, insecurity, uh, whether it's or it's habitual? So I think uh, this is a very good opportunity to combine um, quantitative studies with qualitative interpretation. So uh, we really need to go into, so maybe we conduct the quantitative study and then select a sample uh, and just go and uh, examine and interview. So why diversity as so on? maybe an observational study or maybe an in-depth interview. So that would, uh, I mean, uh, reduce a lot of doubt and uh, give a lot of uh, sort of actual uh, real life situations why these are. So I'm not saying this is uh, due to habitual, but then uh, at this context where, uh, of course, when uh, there is a moderate food insecurity or uh, mild food insecurity, not in severe uh, cases, uh, this would be very uh, valuable to investigate further through qualitative techniques. So uh, asking to uh, draw the diet plan is a qualitative technique as well. But uh, in the RAPCO study, it was not combined with uh, insecurity and because uh, the insecurities uh, like the sample was small, we cannot uh, link the diet plates directly uh, to investigate this, but then it's a good opportunity for further uh, studies. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Talimi. Um, if, if there are any follow-up questions, I'm sure that you can uh, email the authors, but thank you all for your participation in the webinar. And thank you, Pablo, for a wonderful work running us on time. Thank you all very much.